Um, thank you so much for joining us for a panel discussion tonight. We are joined by local experts to try and address the following questions on the board behind me. The first one is, what are the city's greatest needs and challenges? And the second one is, how can we better orient urban planning, particularly in Santa Fe, around meeting these challenges and creating more affordable, environmentally sustainable, and resilient cities? So we're going to explore issues surrounding housing, transportation, urban planning, and more, as well as discuss your role as citizens in addressing these issues. Our panel will be about an hour long, and we'll have some time for questions from the audience at the end. Yeah, so we want to let you guys have a chance to introduce yourselves briefly. So could you each go around, say your name, um, tell us a little bit about yourself? We can start on the show. I'll start. Thank you for having us here this evening. I look forward to hearing all of your questions. My name is Kate Collin. I'm the mayor of San Rafael. I was elected in December 2020. First female, I'll put it out there. When you break the glass ceiling, you need to tell people that. Um, and that, I joined the council in 2013, and before that, I was on the planning commission. So very deep uh, on the policy side of everything that we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, and my name is Jenny Silva. I'm the board chair of the Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative, and we are an advocacy group that's actually largely made up of a lot of ex-city planners, although I am not one myself. <laughs> and um, we advocate for more affordable housing in Marin um, with an environmental and social justice lens. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'm Aaron Burnett. I work at Canal Alliance, where I'm the director of policy and civic engagement. I started there uh, four and a half years ago as an immigration attorney. And uh, a little bit about my history, I grew up out in West Marin and a uh, proud graduate of Tamales High School before I decided to move back out here. So, thank you. Hey, hi everyone. My name is Lee Zhang. Um, I was the Transportation Authority Marin. We are the Transportation Planning and Policy Agency for all the transportation projects and programs in the county. Uh, a little bit about myself. I actually came to the state in 1998. Um, finished my master in accounting um, back in Beijing, my um, home country, and then uh, finished my master in urban planning at the University of Southern California. Um, I I actually like to share with some, you know, when I have opportunity, I think my unique experience having seen the culture and the project um, kind of differences, how it can handle between the two countries, two countries make it sometimes can you know provide some unique insights on how we can do things. Great, thank you. Um, so first, since we're talking so much in this panel about cities and the future of cities, um, we would like to start off by kind of defining what a sustainable and resilient city is. Um, so I would love it if you could each or some of you share a little bit about what a sustainable and resilient city looks like to you. Okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> so, and this is such a great question. I think we're all going to have different ways of answering it, and I think it really is important to define what are, what is it we're trying to achieve here? What is the goal that we want? When I think about sustainability, it's recognizing that we have limited resources, right? So, uh, maybe the mindset of your parents or your grandparents was very different. Like you could build anything with there's just an endless supply of, of materials, endless supply of clean air, clean water, and everything else. We now know that there's actually limited uh, elements in our world, so what are we going to do with the ones that we're going to expend, right? So if you're building a building, you're actually expending, um, you're expending resources. So to me, that's really important. Um, the world has changed. When we talk about sustainability, it's both recognizing that limited resources and recognizing that the world is changing. And you don't need me to tell you that. You just walk outside, you open the newspaper. And so when we're sustainable, how are we going to be building, planning, all the way across the board, across all the sectors, recognizing it can't be business as usual. It just won't work. Uh, so that is key. And it's hard. It's hard to have new paradigms. It's hard to have a new way of doing it. And lastly, when we talk about resilience, because I think you're talking about both sustainability and resilience, um, it is how do we mitigate and adapt to all these changes, and how do we bring along everybody in those mitigations and adapt changes, right? So if you're resilient, you can't just have one, one community or one part of the population that's resilient. It's really how does everyone come along? Um, and I'll stop there. And literally, each of these questions, I seriously could answer over an hour to answer each one. These are super, super deep. And I think um, my colleagues feel the same way, that it's, it's, it, we're just going to give you a little sound bite, and we can go deeper in the Q&A. 
because uh, these are really meaty questions. And I would agree with that. And this is such an interesting question. You could probably do a PhD dissertation. <laughs> on it. Um, but what sustainability and resilience means to me, in terms of sustainability, it means doing our part to reduce greenhouse emissions. I think the time has passed to debate whether or not climate change is real. I think we see um, everything that you've been through in your high school career. It's very clear that this is real. And so we need to do our part in um, reducing emissions. And to a large extent, in Moran, 40% of emissions come from, from cars. So we need to become much less car dependent. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, resilience. We don't know what the future will hold. We know that there's uh, threats of floods and threats of uh, wildfire, but there's a lot more too, as we see years of drought followed by atmospheric rivers and hurricanes in LA. We don't know where the world is going. And so I think it's really important that we're building communities that are able to respond. And to me, that means you need to have your first responders, your governmental staff, you need to have all the people that you need to deal with these things living locally. And if everybody needs to drive an hour and a half, two hours to get to, to your city, you're gonna be really hard pressed to deal with the issues that come up. Yeah, and I guess just the summary of that is I see it as denser, more affordable housing, reduced car dependency, and strong local government. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I, I guess I'm here to kind of bring the lens of equity since I represent uh, the Canal community, which is the largest underserved Latino community in San Rafael. Um, when you're building a sustainable community, um, as Jenny mentioned, like transportation is one of the larger pollutants that we emit. And, and so if we invest all of this infrastructure into building sustainable communities um, that are climate resilient, um, we need to make sure that we're investing uh, sufficient resources into the underserved communities so that they get to continue to live in the community after investments might you know, increase the cost of living. So those are some important things to keep in mind when designing. Yeah, I think all the panelists cover all the big picture. Yeah, there's a overwhelming big questions, but for me, actually, I have been telling my kids, I'm a mom of three. What I have been telling my kids, really, you guys need to be the most important piece. It's actually start to do things to make changes you can um, from now. Um, you know, reduce, I guess, me and I, every time I go anywhere, I'm going to bottle. Um, really reduce the any um, waste, um, any resource, waste resources, and take transit whenever you can. Um, I think, you know, we all know the big policy decisions we got, you know, kind of ask adults to try to worry about that, but for me, I think the future really, where we're going, it really depends on what you guys can do. Great, thank you so much. Um, I really like that, Erin, you talked a little bit about the importance of equity. Mayor Kate, you brought up bringing everyone along and how inclusivity is really important in creating better cities. So this kind of transitions into our next question, which is how does climate change impact communities differently? Um, and what strategies can be implemented to strengthen San Rafael's resilience in the face of natural or climactic disasters? Should we just keep going down the line? Is that up to you. You can switch it up, whatever, whatever works. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, yeah, no. And I actually want to build on something that um, Jenny was talking about. So we're talking about what is resilient, what are climate strategies, and, and what can we, we be doing here to strengthen San Rafael? So there's two parts to that answer. There's, I'll answer it from the policy standpoint, as a policymaker, but also from the individual standpoint. Because a lot of this is about individual resilience. Uh, God forbid, and I'll just take an extreme example, if we have a large scale disaster here, our first responders, to your point, don't all live here. Right, so what are we doing as a community to fill in those gaps where the first responders aren't there? And that's individual resilience, and it's everything from wildfire prevention to being a part of an emergency response team. But it's really recognizing that it, in a large-scale disaster, you're gonna be supporting and helping each other. And that's a really different mindset, right? I, we, we always wanna call 911 and have the, the folks come on up and, and, and help us out. But in the really big disasters, we're going to be really dependent upon each other. So that's getting to know your neighbors. It's getting to do um, the, the expertise that you need in those situations. So the individual part is a really key part. From a policy standpoint, um, climate strategies, 
Uh, Sam Rafael uh, continues to be a leader in this area. Um, we were one of the first cities in Marin County to adopt a climate change action plan. We are the first city in California to win the Beacon Award, which was given out by the Institute of Local Governments recognizing uh, climate initiatives. So this is something that we're not just thinking about now because we've had torrential rains and then droughts. This is something that we've been putting in place for a very long time. Um, in terms of the immediate, we know with the change in climate, with, this, with the Bay rising, when they've done the reports, the um, Bay Area, BCDC, um, when one of the entities, agencies has, has looked at the Bay, as it rises, the first community to be inundated in all of the Bay, the cities that align the Bay, is the community that Aaron was talking about, is in the Canal neighborhood. And that is a, a, a neighborhood that has traditionally been underserved or maybe under-resourced. So knowing that, we already know that as the bay rises, climate change is real, it's going to rise, what are we going to do? So how do we ensure that folks there are resilient, but how do we give the tools, right? So they're, so everyone, regardless of where you live, especially though in the canal, they're part of the solution so they can buy in as well. Um, and the strategies are everything we like to get really grainy and from a policy level, it's both adaptation and mitigation, really in terms of sea level rise, and we could talk about it in terms of wildfire prevention, a lot of that is prevention, uh, vegetation management, so it really depends on what type of climate disaster you're trying to um, address. Um, and I'll stop there, and I'll pass it to Jen. All right. Well, there are a lot of things that Sam Rafael can do, and as Mary Kate said, I think uh, Sam Rafael has been a leader, um, but there's still a lot left to be done. Um, one of the great things that Sam Rafael has done has been to implement its downtown precise plan which has upzoned downtown San Rafael and allowed, allowed a lot more dense, walkable housing to be built there. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. And I think it's a first step. One of the things that's really important as you look at resilience and uh, policy is what is the land use? Um, Marin has been really, really great at preserving open space. It's extraordinarily easy in Marin to preserve open space. We need to get that way about building affordable housing and about reworking our land use so that we um, are better set up for emergencies and that we can house the people that served San Rafael here. Um, so that's one thing that really sticks with me. And, and the other thing that I've really learned as I've gotten involved in this is uh, democracy is a verb, not a noun. <laughs> it's really, really important that um, you know you're not just delegating to your local officials and assume that all the decisions are going to be the decisions that will make for a great future. You actually have to get involved and get engaged and learn what's going on and push. Um, a lot of things that need to change aren't necessarily popular, and so it requires people saying, hey, Mayor Kate, we really need that affordable housing complex and um, to make sure that she knows the communities behind her when she's making those decisions. Pass it on there. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, to the city's credit, the city's been really good at engaging the community on, on this issue, among others. The Canal Alliance is happy to be partnering with the city on two different climate uh, resilience projects, one on the sea level rise adaptation and another year project to do a, a community plan for the canal neighborhood to build a resilient city. Um, speaking of the canal, again, uh, you have approximately 10,000 people living in two square miles, and it's the most uh, prone area in San Rafael to sea level rise. And so I think that speaks for itself. I mean, if you're going to, you know, do some urban planning, uh, that's probably going to be your number one area of focus, I would hope, um, making sure that community is set up first um, as it's the first line of defense um, and at the first, uh, and it's the first uh, um, community that's going to be affected. Um, although a couple years ago, we do all remember that Crystal Park was also flooded. Um, so we're, I mean, everyone's going to be affected, but because of this historically underserved community, there are things that exist today that still haven't been uh, updated, like ingress and egress. If the canal does flood, there's really only, you know, the frontage road. And if that becomes inundated, you have a community of 10,000 that could be way more affected than the rest of us. So those are things to think about when, when designing sustainable cities. 
think on that, on that note, it's a perfect you know, opportunity for me to share with the group and the panel um, that the Transportation Law Sword Mine, again, as the planning agency, we're actually kicking off a countywide transportation vision plan process, which Mayor um, Cohen asked the commission, you know, for Sarah Fell, it's very heavily involved. Um, so one thing we all know now, everything's connected. Um, so wildfire, land use, housing, transportation, civil rights, so it's all connected. You know, we cannot address one without looking at the other issues. So in our transportation, countywide transportation plan, the first for the county, um, we'll be looking at everything. And obviously with a focus on, you know, uh, disadvantaged communities, we'll be working very closely with each jurisdiction, with the Climate Alliance to address the special needs. Um, but again, you know, I think I'm hoping um, we are actually kind of launching out the outreach process. Uh, I do hope our younger generation the students, uh, you guys, can actually be part of that uh, public input process and bring us great ideas. I actually want to just um, jump on something that Aaron said because I really want to underscore how powerful Canal Alliance's partnership and collaboration has been in all of this. Um, so I will toot your, 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 your agency's horn on this. So when we want to create policies or strategies, you need to have trusted messengers, right? And so Canal Alliance is a trusted messenger. When they talk about these two big initiatives, they're big dollars that they went after and that they were able to receive to do these types of planning. And it's a new area to go, you guys are going big, you guys are going in. And it's both the cultural competency that Canal Alliance brings as well as the, the language facility, right? So they're, and it's not just, oh, we speak Spanish, we're fine. You know, Guatemala has many, many dialects. So how do you speak to people and how do you engage with them? And Canal Alliance has been incredible. I can tell you that this work would not be nearly as effective and it wouldn't, even in the future, we're just starting on the work if it wasn't for them um, standing up with other agencies. And, and really that kind of partnership is invaluable. And all of the knocking on the doors that the city would do, we just would not get as far if we didn't have these really deeply embedded community-based organizations, we call them CBOs, kind of to use an acronym. Um, but I really wanted to say that because Canal Alliance is, will be changing our strategies because of their participation. Thanks. Okay, Thank and I'll, you. Thanks. And I'll just add, I am not an urban planner or an expert in this field. I, like I said earlier, I'm an immigration attorney by trade. But because of these grants that we've been able to get through the state, I have been able to bring on some experts on my team, some brilliant young minds who are urban planners. And so we're looking forward to seeing the product at the end of this, this uh, project. Yeah. That's great. It's super interesting to learn more about how important it is to have kind of a bridge between the people and the government and how that can make sure people are more represented and their voices are more heard in government decisions. I think you touching on that and I'd love before we move on to the next question to learn a little bit more. I know we talked about sea level rise in the canal but are there any other ways or examples especially in San Rafael that climate change impacts communities differently? <coughs> you don't have to go to the line. But. Um, I, I think the heat that we've had, we, we, we're pretty blessed here because we get the fog from the city uh, but I think having those heat islands, not everyone has air conditioning, not everyone has um, a, a way to cool off. So I think that's something that what we're still going to be figuring out. You talked about the ingress and egress, which is a fancy way of how do you get in and out of neighborhood evacuation roads. Um, we're doing, I mean, we're thinking about these issues, and it's one thing to think and then start to identify what are the different programs. Uh, we've talked a lot about wildfire prevention, what happened up in Coffee Park a couple years ago. Coffee Park, if you had gone up there, it looked like Terra Linda. Like it was a regular suburb and that was surrounded by regular streets. It wasn't way up, it wasn't out in West Room. People were like, oh yeah, you know, there are hills out there. So really again, having people figure out what can they do on their own property and how does the city and how do the agency start to clear uh, more vegetation, which we know there's always, it's always tricky, right? I have to say, I get emails when people are getting trees cut down. You know, and I get it. I love trees too. I'm a big tree hugger and I love it, but I look at the big picture and, and we need to have a both and we need to have a balance. I don't know what else you guys would add. I mean, I think we're on the climate. <laughs> yeah, I guess, well, there's a difference right there. All right, if, when you think about, you know, climate change, are you worried about the tree next door eating it down? Or are you worried about, you know, your entire house being underwater? And if it is, you have nowhere else to go because you're living paycheck to paycheck. So. Those are the two differences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, also kind of <coughs> related to equity, we've talked a little bit in our TLP climate justice class about how, and just the two of us, how public transportation can be used as a means to increase accessibility and equity. Um, so I'd love to learn more about what effective public transportation strategies are already in place in Marin and what improvements can be made. Which Please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little different. Um, you know, we're not the transit agency, so you guys know we're a transit, a transit agency, but obviously we work very close with this morning transit. Um, I guess a little bit personal view first. Um, I came, as I said, I came from a country that public transit obviously was the only way I traveled um, until I came here, actually. I knew that I came here. Um, so it worked because of the events that we have. Um, so my struggle with public transit is really here, we don't have the density um, to support it. And then, you know, so when you don't have the frequency of services, you know, it's very hard to get people who are dependent on transit to use it. Um, one thing actually I have been really passing my kids to do is really whenever you go, if you can use transit, I want to use transit. So, you know, my oldest goes to UCLA, uh, I've been telling her, take that transit bus from the airport to your school instead of Uber it, you know. Um, so I think that's a, that's a culture change. I, I would challenge all of you to think about it. Whenever you go some places, you know, look at the option first. Most of us probably don't even look at the option because we have a car, you know, we have easy access to parents and to friends. Um, so I think that change is very important and fundamental because from a fi financial point, as I shared it with the group, I'm a, you know, accounting first and then I become a planner. It is heartbreaking for us to pull all that money into transit when we have constant complaints, you know, you have one person on that bus, you really need that bus out there. So I think for us really to change in that culture, to make transit more effective, for, for, for everybody, it's really we need to get more of you to get on transit. Uh, so that for me is from a personal you know, observation and things I'm trying to change. Now when I go, anywhere I go, I actually get the transit bus you know, passes first. If I can spend you know, just using transit, I was going to do that. Um, so that's a big cultural and mental change. And then in terms of what Marine have already in terms of public transportation, you know, they're calling it some Marine Transit uh, board. We do have a very effective system. Marine Transit staff does a great job in terms of trying to, you know, plan the service, trying to make the best use of the source they have already. Um, I know one thing they're trying to do is really um, trying to integrate school services into the bus routes so, you know, students can use it. Um, so I think for me, again, goes back to, um, you know, we can keep building, we can keep putting money into transit, but also we're hoping um, the new generation can meet us, you know, where we are. Um, this way we can do it a lot, hopefully a lot more cost effectively. Um, because you, you guys probably are here now, we have transit clip in California because, for example, BART, you know, the commuter's not going back. So BART, they're 70, 80% dependent on fare revenue. So when you don't have the riders going back, they're not getting that fare revenue, so they have a, have a huge financial problem. Um, so anyway, um, you know, we will continue to deliver more transit services, especially for those in need. Learning transit focus has always been the transit dependent riders. But on the other hand, I'm really hoping to see some of you on the transit buses um, help us kind of like don't get to the right direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is something I want to talk a little bit about because um, transit's actually what got me into land use and kind of down this path and where I am now with uh, Marin Housing. Uh, but uh, I first really started thinking about transit when I was taking my kids to school every day and thinking, why am I sitting in 40 minutes of traffic to go down Sir Francis Drake? Um, there's 800, you know, and I started calculating all the cars that were going down there that were just driving and dropping kids off, and it was just crazy. And when I grew up in California, we had school buses. Those, um, and I started to research, they didn't have them, Mill Valley tried one, and the parents needed to be paying for the school bus, so they had to pay 500 a semester. And to me, this is all backwards. Um, we should be looking at non-car transit as the default, and only having cars when it's necessary. And what that looks like from a school uh, situation is, 
you should pay if you want to drop off your kids at school using a car. <laughs> the bus should be free. Why are the parents subsidizing everybody for having less cars on the road? It's really, it's backwards at this point. Um, but growing up in California, it is hard not to absorb the message that transit is for the poor people, and it's not what we use. Um, I was fortunate enough to spend some time this summer in Vienna and Zurich, and I can say, there, you don't even want to get in the car. The public transit is beautiful, it's convenient, it's far more comfortable than driving. It is the preferred choice. And some of the towns in Europe where you have this level of transit really aren't any more dense than San Rafael is. Of course, the more dense housing we get in place, the more that we can support the transit, that helps also. But as you said, there is a cultural change that needs to be, that needs to take place. Um, and in addition to public transit, I also just want to put a word out for active transit, uh, riding bikes, walking, uh, if you go to Amsterdam or Copenhagen, you know, 60 percent of the people are traveling by bike. Obviously, weather is not the same there as it is here. If you can do it there, you can do it here. But our bike infrastructure is so weak, and so um, there are some stretches where it's really great. But then you go to ride on Blythdale from Camino Alto to the bike path, and you're sitting in cars. And there's little breaks all over the place that make it that as a parent, I wouldn't want my kids riding down Sir Francis Strait to go to school um, when they're little. That's just not a very comfortable feeling. We can do so much better, and our roads are so big and wide. There's plenty of room to take a little space, <laughs> use it for bikes. Um, with the advent of e-bikes, there's so much more that we can do in Marin to, um, to get people out of cars. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, it, I think I, I would uh, really tout the services of Marin Transit. They're doing a really good job. Um, and they recently cut their, I think there's a lot of opportunity in transportation in many areas. Sustainability, of course, as you mentioned, as both of you mentioned, but also in workforce development. Uh, Marin Transit just cut routes because, not because of lack of demand, but because of lack of bus drivers. Um, now Alliance, once again, broken record. You know, we're working on trying to funnel um, members of, of the canal community into becoming bus drivers. Um, and that's our green job of the future because Marin Transit, for example, just got a $35 million grant to purchase some electric buses. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunities in, in the area of transportation. Um, talking again about the canal, there's more cars in the canal than parking spaces. I think in San Rafael in general, parking is an issue. Um, the more we can start to adopt electric bicycles and public transportation as a as a mode of transportation and start to transfer those current technologies into electric technologies, I think it's one of the best things we can do to, to build resilient, sustainable communities. Yeah. You already given a full answer, so I'll, um, I'll just add a few things. You had started out by talking about how transportation uh, really creates the highest amount of emissions in our community. So this is a, I mean, this is a topic that we really do have to think about it differently. Um, in addition to being on the Transportation Authority of Marin with Lee, um, I'm also on SMART, which is the Snow Marin Area Rapid Transit, and I've been a member of Marin Transit. And so I understand, I've learned a lot about transit in Marin, and the transit in Marin is different than, for example, than BART. So what we did here years ago, we, you know, your parents and your grandparents, if they've been in Marin County, is they agreed to tax themselves to get funding for transportation. So we are able to use those dollars to yellow school buses, there is a yellow school bus program, but to your point, um, it's kind of cobbled together a little bit. Um, so we are able to deal with or manage that fiscal cliff that Lee was talking about a little bit differently here because we're not as fare box uh, dependent. When I say we, I'm talking about Marin Transit. <coughs> so Marin Transit is for folks that are transit dependent. For the most part, when you look at our ridership, our, the ridership did not fall off during COVID. People got to stay home and work from home. The folks that were using Marin Transit are folks that needed to be in a grocery store, they needed to be in a hospital, they were actually still out in the world um, and they couldn't just be in their home. Um, and then you have Golden Gate Transit, which is really commuter based, and they have huge struggles. So we'll get to see what's happening with them. Their numbers have gone way down. Both Smart and Marin Transit has seen their ridership come back post COVID, 
uh, Golden Gate has it. So they're going to have to be rethinking about how, how are they going to be, how are they going to sustain their future. Um, and the, all, the only thing I wanted to mention on transportation, so Marin County, there are 11 cities and towns plus the county in Marin County. All of us are competing for the same dollars when it comes to transit projects. And one thing that TAM does a great job of is prioritizing projects and prioritizing funding. I love it because the Rappel ends up getting a lot of that money and a lot of those projects because this is where a lot of the ridership is. But I think that's something that is really important from a policymaker to think about. So when we're competing for funds, what do we bring to the table and how are we competing against Belvedere, for example? And I'm not saying that there are projects that are less important in other cities and towns, but there's finite resources. That's kind of going to be a theme that you're going to take away from tonight. So knowing there's finite what is your best bang for the buck when it comes to transit? And that's both infrastructure, bikes, um, having access to uh, electric vehicles, all of that good stuff. Hey, thank you all for touching on both all the amazing work Marin Transit is doing and all the great things happening with public transportation in Marin, and also the room for improvement and um, the challenges with transportation. Um, I'm curious, on that note of equity and inequity, um, in your experience, how has the extreme pre privilege President Marin impacted or served as an obstacle um, in planning, particularly when it comes to topics such as housing, for example? Go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as many of you know, Marin County is the premier county in America when it comes to open space, like most of the land that is still undeveloped is undevelopable. So we have a finite amount of land um, to develop on, which has, among other things, you know, raised the price of living and the cost of living. Um, and uh, I, I think um, there's a laundry list of, of things that we can do to um, address this issue. I, I don't think that a three minute answer is gonna be able to, to even narrow down um, some of the items that we could talk about. But there, there, there are things that we can do to protect renters, first of all, that the community that's here now that are on fixed incomes that can't afford to keep up with the increasing rents every, every year. Um, but then I think we also need to think well, shoot, you know what, it's just too big of a, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to pass this on and then maybe jump in. And, and, yeah. when, when you asked the question, the first thing that came to my mind about um, the extreme privilege and how that impacts housing, um, I will say, as a housing advocate, I have lots of stories, but, <laughs> but to me, the most extreme is in Sausalito, somebody proposed to build a house on a lot that was zoned for single family homes, should have been easily approved. One of the neighbors didn't want it built. They actually sent a mailer to every resident in 94965 with all sorts of information on why this was a terrible thing to have happen. And they actually succeeded. The, the person building a house, this is all a true story, Malaysian billionaire, like this person had endless resources, the neighbor won. <laughs> they got enough people in there uh, complaining to the planning commission, complaining to the city council, that they ultimately decided not to build that. Um, so it is a real issue that we need to deal with in Marin. It's very, very hard because any project that gets proposed, um, it's like Aaron says, we have a lot of open space. We're largely doing infill development. That means you're building next to somebody, and nobody likes to live next door to a construction site. You know, it's a hassle. And so there's going to be people that fight it, and we have people with an enormous amount of resources to fight it. And you hear threats of, you know, we're going to, um, well, there's lawsuits that are filed all the time against projects. There's a, a, an all-affordable project in Mill Valley, and Mill Valley is actually suing that this project's going to cause segregation, which... There, you don't have any segregation in Mill Valley. It is a white community, and so it, it's really, um, it's really um, a ridiculous claim, a lawsuit without merit. Um, and so this is really why you see the state of California making lots of laws to streamline approvals in local areas. 
and people often hate it. Um, you hear lots of cries of loss of local control. This is, you know, Sacramento can't tell us what to do. But we have seen that if Sacramento doesn't tell us what to do, we choose not to build. And Marin has had the lowest rate of housing production per capita for decades. Um, and so, uh, so yes, the privilege causes a lot of problems. It's been very, very effective in stopping the development of affordable housing. That's why things are so bad in Marin. And we do need to look at tools on how we overcome. So I think this is probably my unique background, kind of. <laughs> um, so obviously, as I shared, you know, I grew up in a communist country. So when the central government says this is the right thing to do, we're going to make it happen, and it happens within an amazing amount of time. So my favorite story to share um, is um, my uh, graduate school thesis when I was, um, you know, back in university in Beijing was the feasibility study of the high-speed uh, rail between Beijing and Shanghai. That was back in 1997. Within 20 years, you know, high-speed rail is all over the country. Um, you can only imagine every time I go back, my friends was like, if you stay, you would have made history with us. And then when I came here, I first started working with the Metropolitan Transport Commission, uh, Transportation Commission, which is the regional transportation policy and uh, funding agency for the Nine Bay Area County, and we were talking about BART to San Jose Extension. That was a 20-year project for a small segment. So I do, I, I, I see I'm not a patient person to, to start with, <laughs> so I guess may um, Colin, we share the same, you know, the, the process, the project, you know, environmental process, and how easy someone can just file a lawsuit to, to stop a project to stop that whole process, it is frustrating. Um, so I definitely can see some high level policy change, legal change, to the, to the extent that one person, as you should, in that instant, one you know, cannot just, you know, because of personal uh, interest, start a whole project moving forward. So I think that's on the biggest uh, scale. I'm hoping we will have some changing. Um, you know, I, I definitely see the benefit of local control but as a parent, I have to say, you know, I tell my kids, in my house, you have to follow my rules. So, <laughs> so I think we have to kind of balance that out. Uh, and my frustration really would get into a point that we're just wasting the time just doing, looking at the trade off, going back and forth, but we're not getting anywhere. Um, so I'm really hoping, you know, we can all realize that and hopefully gradually can make some bigger change and, and realize that we really need to work together. We really need to be able to, um, you know, do trade-offs and give up some things in order for us to all have a better future. Yeah, I, I think just on a very like high level, as far as NIMBYism goes, not in my backyard, um, the environmentalists in this county, I include myself as an environmentalist, I, I would say, have one, you know, with 80% of the space already unbuildable, uh, we need to we need to approach it with an open mind um, and and not think of uh, affordable housing as a dirty word, and and maybe start to change the minds of of our of our friends at the Sierra Club and other um, environmental groups um, who who are behind a lot of the nimbyism. I mean, I have lots of friends that are in this great club as well. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bashing this great club so much as to say um, environmental first doesn't mean like environmental only. And in, in, in the case of San Rafael, because there is not that much land, infill is really one of the only solutions. So assuming there is funding to build, we are going to really have to build up. Um, and so to, to come at that with an open mind, um, acknowledging that if we're going to be equitable in uh, Allowing uh, our community to work in that, to live in the community that they work in, we're going to have to look at uh, opportunities to do more of those projects where we build up. Thank you. That's kind of what inspired us to do this panel is kind of balancing like environmentalism, but also the need for affordable housing and how do we balance all these needs? And obviously, everyone has different opinions and wants different things. So balancing the interests of different groups. So it's interesting to hear more. About. Um, so, I I think, so I always want to 
um, clarify something. Cities don't build housing. Just remember that. City, so the city of San Rafael does not build housing. Who builds housing are developers, and it can be either residential or commercial. And that's a really important distinction because what we do is we create the framework through ordinances, state laws, all of the like legal requirements for building projects to come forward. And if I had, it could just be a nickel or a penny for every time I got an email that said, we shouldn't do this or you should stop this because, the reality is if our ordinances and the laws allow that project to be brought forward, it would be illegal for the city of San Rafael to say, oh, you know what, we heard you, we're, not go we're, we're, we're gonna ask the developer not to do that building. So I just wanna clarify, because so often people think that we're the ones that are bringing forth projects, and the reality is we create the environments for projects to be brought for us. Um, San Rafael, and I, I do wanna, our city, we have been uh, at the forefront of trying to minimize any unintended obstacles for building and projects being brought here. As I mentioned, I was on the council in 2013 as a planning commissioner eight years before that. I can tell you, in all those decades, there was never a housing project that the planning commission or the city of San Rafael did not approve. Just think about that. Doesn't mean it got built, though. So that's a difference. You can approve it, but it has to get built. There's financing. There's all these other different things that come on. So um, in San Rafael, we've been incredibly pro-housing. Uh, the state, and as my colleagues have mentioned, the state has said, you know what, your jurisdiction, California, are not building the way you need to, so they have some very aggressive laws that have gone into place over the last year. Those laws are really designed to have each of our allocation of housing. So up in Sacramento, they looked at the state, they divvied up the number of housing units by city and county, and it's called the Regional Housing Need Allocation, RENA for short. So our arena numbers got a lot bigger. And what used to happen was they would say, oh, these are your arena numbers. And the cities were like, oh, that's so nice. Now we're just going to go do whatever we feel like and not really pay attention. What's changed is the state has now said, you know what, we're actually not kidding around. These numbers are bigger, and you need to meet them. Uh, in Marin County, when the new arena numbers came out, I was contacted by other electeds. And all the other electeds in the other, or all the other cities in Marin County signed a letter saying that they didn't agree with it and that they were going to be part of a lawsuit against the state mandated numbers. Sarah Fell did not sign that letter because that is, it's, it's unbelievable to think we're going to freeze our community in time. And to be fair, Sarah Fell's bigger, we can actually absorb housing. Our number is a lot bigger, let me tell you, than all the other jurisdictions. So we're going to continue to bring in the projects that we want. And people, when you talked about the NIMBY, which you can never call someone, like you can't call people names, right? Because they get really defensive. NIMBY is the same thing, right? But I have so many examples of people calling in, because you know you don't have to go to a council meeting, you can actually call in. We'd love to have you guys call in. And they say, I love this housing project. This housing project is amazing. But it's just not right because and then they fill in the blank. And I'm like, God, that's the definition of NIMBY. I don't say that. I think it. <laughs> and, and it's just so, we almost have to get out of our, our own way. We have to realize that when we think of our community, it's going to look different. And I'll end with a small anecdote. So um, the downtown precise plan, Jen mentioned, basically allows for higher density, just as Aaron said. We have to go up. We can't go out. That is that. To hit our numbers, that's what we need to do. There's a huge project that has been approved by the city council uh, two months ago. It's at 1515 4th Street, which is across from Istanbul Rugs. So you can walk next time you're out there getting lunch. Yes, please buy lunch if you're not here in downtown San Rafael. We want you supporting our merchants. Um, but there's an old bank building there. And that building, I have to take a deep breath when I even say this, it's going to be eight stories tall. So when you look at that street and you're like eight stories, I mean, I'm honest. I'm like... I heard that and I was like, okay, okay. And then you start to look at the project and that includes both, it's not 100% affordable. It has both affordable and market rate. But what it means is that when you think of our downtown, you're gonna build it, where are you gonna build it? You're like, oh my God, we're gonna build it on Fourth Street, right? That's the dense part of our, our community. Um, and if you go on next door, they're fondly calling that Mayor Kate's monstrosity. Just so you know. <laughs> Thank you so much for clarifying. Sorry about the next door. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> oh, I do. They, I, I give them a lot of fodder. Next door, love space. I do really want to commend Sam Rafael because it is.
really, I think, the jurisdiction that did the best job of saying we've got all this housing we need to accommodate, what's a plan that will actually make it happen? And from my understanding, that's where the downtown precise plan came mm -hmm. from. And we can actually get the housing that we need. Um, as you said, all the other jurisdictions, except for, I think, Novato. They didn't send the letter? Uh, I'm not anyway. sure. Okay, we won't send anyway. the best. Okay. <laughs> not sure about them, but I know the rest of them that did. And they all say, we're full, we can't possibly build more housing. I'm down in Sausalito, and you know everybody there is up in arms. There's no way we can get 724 units in here. You know, during World War II, 20,000 people lived there. Now there's 720 people that live there. We can fit 700 more units in. It is not a problem. Um, we will have to build some denser housing in some places. Um, we won't even have to go as dense as some of the apartment buildings that we have there. But it is absolutely doable. We have plenty of room. Um, we just need to do it. And, and do what Sam Rafael did and say, you know what, more housing can go here than we've historically had, and that's going to be okay. I think there's one thing we missed too. What, what do you tell a room full of high school stu students? Is get out and vote. Um, <laughs> and, and in, in November of next year, there's going to be a ballot initiative to fund the Bay Area uh, Housing Finance Authority. It's a regional initiative and um, has a sister initiative too. But if that one doesn't pass, it'll need like 66% plus one of the vote to pass. And if, if it does pass, it would go towards funding Marin County. Um, in the, in the ability to build affordable housing to the tune of approximately $750 million. So it's, it's a big deal and share it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a great transition to our next question. This is the last one before we turn it over to the audience, but um, we'd love to learn more about what role can Marin residents and community members play in shaping urban planning decisions and ensuring the sustainability of our city. So we mentioned voting, but any other things we can do? Well, if you're brave enough, show up on next door. I mean, I, that's, I think that is where a lot of trolls live, I need to say. But So maybe it's not next door, but it's when you're talking to your neighbors and they're like, God, did you hear about this fill-in-the-blank big building density? And your comment can be, well, tell me more. Why are you worried about that? Hear what they have to say and say, you know, I actually support it. And this is why I've got to get in conversation about it, right? To just sit there and lob like one-liners or, you know, call each other names. We're not going to build that kind of... Um, collective action that we need to build. So it's really having that conversation with people. And it's hard. This stuff's hard. Uh, people feel very, very strongly about changing their environment. So get in conversation and show up. I mean, I would love it when we have projects that come to San Rafael that you are in the dot, you are in the chambers, or you're calling in. You're like, hey, I go to school in San Rafael. I think it's okay to have more housing. I just you can give your name or not and say, say your two sentences and you can hang up. Show up, because to Jen's point, a lot of the, and again, Sarah Phelps been very brave, we don't have a lot of people calling in. The people that call in are the people that are like, we shouldn't have this, right? So to have more people saying, you know what, it's okay. I, I want to support this, that would be incredible. Yeah, and, and sometimes just one voice can make a difference. Yeah. I've been in meetings where just having one good comment being for the housing has changed yeah. the whole tone of the conversation. Um, but I, I couldn't agree with you more. Show up, vote, really important. I also advocate to everyone, educate yourself. Yeah. We have grown up in this car-centric world, and we feel like this is the way it must be. But um, many of the people whose families are at Marine Academy, I know, have had trips to Europe and walked around the lovely European villages, and you just feel like that's impossible here. We could never do it in America. The thing is, the things that make those communities so nice um, are things we can do here. And there's lots of people who've written about it. There's lots of communities around the world that have gone from car dependent to non-car dependent. And so we have resources at, the, at our website at MEC, at the Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative. Always throw out, read Jane Jacobs, um, The Death and Life of Cities. It's a great book. It's, a, it's kind of an old historical, but it just makes you think of cities and city planning a little bit differently. But, but learn what you can. Like I said, people bike to everywhere in Amsterdam all year long, and that is really, really crummy weather. Um, a lot of the things that people's instincts of what you can't do here have been solved elsewhere. So figure it out. Learn. See what other people are doing. And that helps when you have the people ask the questions. Oh, this is terrible. Then you have a base. 
to the talk. Yeah. Well, again, I think I shared this already. Um, I think the most important is really starting with ourselves. You know, as Mayor said, be there on the policy level, but really um, fundamentally start from ourselves, changing out how we live our life. You know, when you pull that phone to call that Uber ride, uh, I think with Google now, it actually gave you that transit option as well. Mm -hmm. um, when you're about to get your car out of the garage, you know, if you see your bike, get on your bike. Um, um, so I think also, you know, when you go for that one-time use plastic um, uh, water cup, actually just remember to bring your water bottle with you every time. Um, I, I truly believe, you know, the little things actually that what make the big difference. Mm -hmm. And if we'll all, all of us together can do that, and that's what the magic we need here. Yes. Santa, Santa Falls is a pretty cool city. It's, it's relatively large, but the amount of people that you see at City Hall during council meetings is, is minimal, and you end up hearing a lot of probably the same people next door that call in and troll, <laughs> troll the mayor and the council members. <laughs> but I've learned from personal experience, if you go um, to a city council meeting, and, and or at least two of them, and, and add some uh, value to the conversation, by the third time, the mayor's going to know you by your first name. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to feel special, I would do. Speak out at the city council meeting. Um, but, but also, if any of you are urban planning nerds, like there is a planning commission, I'd encourage you all to listen in to some of their meetings. Um, everything's on Zoom these days and, and hybrid, so I would just get engaged. Yeah. And when a high school or recent college grad said, comes up and says, I can never live here unless this uh, building gets built, uh, a lot of the folks that are opposing it start to change their start to, you know, meter their, their speech a little bit and start to, you know, people don't want to kick our youth out of the, the town and it's really important that you speak up. Yeah, thank you for all those responses. Um, speaking for myself, uh, speaking for myself, sometimes as a young person it's easy to think, oh, maybe I don't have a say in that, um, so it's really helpful to like hear all the ways in which we do have a say and we can get involved. So thank you for that. Um, now turning it to the audience, does anyone have a question? Yeah, Maria. Um, so right now I know that San Rafael is combating a lot of homelessness, and I was wondering about how this could possibly affect like urban planning and moving forward, especially regarding climate change, um, and how it affects San Rafael. Well, as Lee said earlier, everything is connected, right? So we really learned that during um, COVID, and homelessness, when you look at the state of California, it's some crazy stat. Like we have 60% of the unhoused population in the United States. And so what happens here in San Rafael is not because we're doing something right or we're doing something wrong. It's because we're in California where the housing, uh, what was it, one housing unit for like every six jobs that's been created over the last couple decades. Not exactly the stat, but it is that type of um, extreme. And so we have not had enough housing of all types, you need market rate all the way down to affordable housing. So the solution, and this is a, I really have given a two hour presentation on this, so I will just say one thing. The solution at homelessness is permanent supportive housing. So you get someone into a house and then wrap them with, with social services or case management. Folks that have been on the street, their safety net is broken. They're there because for whatever reason, um, they, have a broken safety net, they are not supported. And it could be mental health, it could be addiction, there could be a lot of different reasons, domestic violence, a lot of different reasons. So you get someone in a house and you provide the services and that's what enables folks to start moving forward. Um, in the United States, there was a landmark case that was passed, well, it's quite a while ago now, but the Supreme Court decided not to hear it in July of 2020, so the Ninth Circuit case held, and it's called Martin versus Boise. Go read about it. It basically, the very tiny tools that jurisdictions had to work with folks or to maybe nudge them towards um, getting the help that they need were removed in that if you don't have enough shelter beds for everyone, you are not, if, if we don't have enough shelter beds in Marin County, which we don't, then someone who's homeless is allowed, federally protected, to be on any public property. 
So they couldn't come and do an encampment here on Marin Academy because it's a private space. But if you go to City Hall, there's a gentleman there that's been there for years. And it's not that we don't engage with folks, but folks that are unhoused, they actually have their own rights too, right? So the, folk, the guy in City Hall, he's like, well, he, he, he doesn't think he needs to be helped, but he's been there a long time. So it's an incredibly complex issue. And going back to what you were just saying about education, um, it would be incredible if uh, folks continue to educate themselves about homelessness, um, one, and understand the complexity of it, and two, um, the tools that might have been used back when I was a kid, or your parents were kids, or your grandparents were kids, oh, we're just going to arrest them. My favorite is like, oh, well, if there's a homeless person in Tiburon, the police are going to arrest them. I'm like, I hope not, because that's totally illegal. And so uh, folks have, have rights, right? Um, but really understanding how can we support people that are, that are on the streets. So when it comes to urban planning, it really is about housing. So that's the long way of answering, coming back to your question. It's actually about having these housing units built. And as an aside, there are quite a few housing units coming online for unhoused individuals, an entire spectrum of need. And they're coming on over the next three, four years. Uh, there's a big one down in South Elysio. And I'll just get on my soapbox just for a second. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's one in South Elysio, which was in a really decrepit building over where the medical buildings are. I don't know if you have your doctors over there. And that building was being rehabilitated for unhoused folks. And the Larkspur community, a big part of the school community, came out against it. And the fear mongering that went with it, everything from, and I'm just going to be real. If you know me, I tell it to you real. The fear mongering that came out, we don't want those people here because they're pedophiles. Like, I'm sorry, pedophilia, it's actually, that's not, it is a thing, but it doesn't happen from unhoused community, some child walking to school. It doesn't happen. But that kind of narrative, if you're a parent, you're going to be signing that petition. And so hats off to the county of Marin, hats off to Supervisor Katie Rice for staying firm and saying that this project needs to be built. It's been built and the grand opening is this week, next week, it's, it's coming online. But that's a perfect example where the fear mongering took over. And that's that intersection you're talking about of inner urban planning and housing. Um, and it, it, it was not a fine moment, I don't think, for the Larkspur and for some of the, the parents that, that were there. Um, the project is there, it's gonna be great, and the, the unhoused folks are gonna get the support they need. Um, but this is hard stuff, and I would never, never want you to think I'm being glib at all about it. This is hard stuff because um, when we see folks that are unhoused, they make us nervous, right? And so I, I want to honor that, that we feel nervous, um, and we have to also feel compassion. How dare we live in the United States, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and we have people who are unhoused. Okay, off my soapbox. <laughs> I just want to add to that. I would say <laughs> the fear mongering of the the unhoused people in South Elysio always gets me because it, it's hard for me to understand a world in which your children are going to be at greater risk if they're actually housed in a place that's taking care of them and have services than if they're unhoused and on the street. So I haven't quite followed the logic. But I do want to build on what Mayor Cake said and just emphasize while it is complicated on one level, on another level it's not. Homelessness is a housing problem, period. And it is true that the folks that end up on the street are the most vulnerable in the community, they're the most likely to have addictions, they're the most likely to have mental health problems. But homelessness is not an addiction problem and it's not a mental health problem. If it was an addiction problem, West Virginia would have far more homelessness than we did. If it's a mental health problem, Mississippi would have much more um, homelessness than we do. It is fundamentally a housing problem, and California has not built housing for decades. That is why we have these crazy numbers of homeless people, and why we need to make change in order to resolve it. I think, yeah, my main focus is uh, advocating for the community in the canal of about 10,000 people where, in many cases, residents are spending over 75% of their income on housing. Um, and in some cases, are spending hundreds of dollars just for the right to sleep for eight hours on a couch um, at night. Um, I, would, I do want to give credit to the city of Santa Fe, though. Like the, the Santa Fe Police Department employs an MFT. I'm not sure how many police departments have a therapist that goes around to engage uh, the in-house population. I think it's a, a really awesome 
things that the city does. And um, also, I, I'm happy that there's like new facilities being built. I, I would say that I would put emphasis on not putting too many more of those facilities in the canal. We already have, you know, Jonathan's place, which is wonderful, and, and there's another home key project being built on, on Kerner. Um, but it's important, I think, to, to fight, you know, fight the, the trolls online or, or the people who, the fear mongering, um, so that we can have a more equitable distribution of, of where those housing facilities end up going. Great, thank you. Yeah, please take another question. I have a question. Um, I, uh, I lived in Copenhagen was born and raised there, so I went to school 40 years back, and we learned about, we had green teams there, lifestyle changes, and all. that was 40 years back. 20 years ago, they started implementing that, you know, if we need to change our city, we need to teach it in elementary school, that everything is interconnected. I have a daughter here, I don't see that. You know, I live in a very privileged neighborhood in Tiburon, and the only thing they do is green team, beach cleaning, you know, recycling, which was done years ago. And if you go to Scandinavia and ask them, that's not really what we should be focusing on, right? So why are the school districts not involved in this? Because if you get a child in elementary school to learn about it, that child will talk about it at home, that everything is connected. For example, the a building of houses in Tiburon, same thing, right? Everybody's against it because of traffic. They don't understand how will we go down Tiburon Boulevard, you know? If you build down, uh, uh, housing in downtown Tiburon. And that makes sense, you know? But I just don't feel that, you know, the, the youth is able to talk to the older generation that are on next door, read the, the blogs and whatever. You know, so, so how, how, do we, how do we get younger, the younger generation involved in this faster? Because you, like you say, in the US, we need to change policies first in order to do anything, right? Because you have lawyers. So I, I, I just don't understand. There's a lot of talk, but I, I, I just don't understand where, wh 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 where do you see all this is going if you don't educate people faster, earlier? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Agree. <laughs> so, yeah. No, go ahead. I was saying, well, we definitely have some programs. I think it um, depends on the, the grade and what we think the kids are capable of. So we have the Safe House to School programs, which cover some of the policy elements, you know, um, you know, travel by you know, bike and walking and all that. So we stop that definitely from the elementary program. And then I totally, you know, I agree with you. I think we really need to, you know, this is our future here. You guys are really the main force of how we can change. Um, but I think at the middle school level, again, I have elementary school, high school, and college kids. So you can see the whole, you know, spread. Um, at, the element, at the middle school level, definitely that's when we can introduce more policy element. But I think there's still a limitation in terms of what the kids can actually embrace. But the high school, that's really the best time. Um, really, you know, having programs, uh, educate the kids, make sure they understand everything is connected. Um, my oldest actually went through the Marine School of Environmental Science at Terralinda, so they actually have a lot of great programs focused on it. I'm pretty sure it seems like this, you guys probably have similar program. Um, but you get, you can get a driver's license at 16 here. That means the kid will drive. Do you understand? In Europe, it's 18. Well, we have public transportation, so oh, that's a good need, idea, actually. Even though the kids probably hate you by no, now. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I have I discussed this with my uh, family friends and their kids. The only thing they look forward to is that 16 years and driving. So we can talk about all these programs, but in reality, reality is a little different. Yeah, totally. And um, you know, I think that's 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 a fundamental change we're talking about. You know, we are very, you know, privileged in this county. You know, every kid's probably by 16, they can not only have a car, probably have a nice new car. Um, so really, it's on the kids, on, par on us parents, 
in terms of, like, it's good to have option. I do want my kids to have option too, but then what's in the option you have? Let's also make sure the kids are extra educated enough and responsible enough to make the right <coughs> choice. Um, so, but I, I guess I like the idea of you don't get your driver's license until 18, so <laughs> maybe even 21. <laughs> That's a, that's a higher level change. Yeah. Um, but in, in terms of program, I will see probably parents working with students um, come up with different programs at different, you know, at different level and to really start kind of like, you know, I, I like to tell my kids we're brainwashing you to, st stop, to start the positive brainwash yeah, early enough. <laughs> so we actually all focus on the right thing. Yeah. I love the idea though. I was a <laughs> child of the non-smoking campaigns and we were very successful at getting our parents to quit. We were inundated as kids on why smoking was terrible. And go home, why are you guys trying to kill us? Um, it'd be wonderful to educate younger kids on the benefits of higher density housing, transit, um, and changing the whole mental attitude towards driving versus not driving. Um, I personally love when I don't have to take a car. I think it's wonderful to have options, but we just don't have that here. Um, but that's, I don't know, maybe the teachers would know <laughs> what we need to do for that. That's beyond my, my knowledge. Great, thank you all. Um, yeah, I think we have time for just about one more question. Um, yeah, Brooke, you can go on. Um, how do you plan on balance building this very important affordable housing but also protecting some of the very important natural ecosystems we have in Marin and San Rafael. And also, how do you, are you able to ensure that the housing being built is actually affordable? Because housing prices are typically quite expensive. I will say the first part of the question is, from my standpoint, very straightforward. We do, <laughs> we, we balance those by building up, by building more density. We can, um, there's lots of places where we have single family homes uh, zoned. We can put apartment buildings in. Many people think, oh, that's a terrible thing. Well, I'm gonna ruin the neighborhood if we have an apartment building. The neighborhoods in San Francisco are highly desirable. The neighborhood I lived in had single family homes, duplexes, and apartment buildings all in one block. And it was a very desirable place to live. So, um, you know, by building more where you already have housing, you're not encroaching on those um, ecosystems. And then in terms of making it affordable, there's that could be a, a dissertation, but the bottom line is you've got to build a lot of it and you need to fund affordable housing. Like Aaron said, there's gonna be a bond on the 2024 um, ballot for affordable housing and it's really important that that get funded if we wanna have affordable housing, we need to pay for it. I would say the other point really, you know, when you're not building the food of housing, you're actually damaging, potentially damaging the ecosystem even more because you can have people travel three hours, mm -hmm. you know, every day to get to work. Um, all those travel, um, the traffic, the congestion, and that really is going to be very damaged to the ecosystem. So I think one thing we really need to focus on is like whenever homeless come up, whenever open housing come up, it's all negative. You know, it's not, it's a balance act. Um, so I think that's probably one way of kind of really looking at the picture together. I think I kind of tied in the Sierra Club earlier, but I think one of the <laughs> key, key things you need to do is create a big tent um, in, your, in your affordable housing coalition that includes environmental groups so that everyone's on the same side and you're looking at housing through that environmental lens and merging you know, humanitarian and environmental issues together. And to their credit, the Sierra Club is, I think, doing a good job of trying to switch um, or pivot into more of a humanistic lens in their, in their advocacy. So yeah, I think a big tent is the solution. Thank you all so much for all of your insight. Um, I think we're a little bit over time, so we're going to wrap it up. But thank you all so much for being here today. Um,